and welcome to Basic Folk, where we have honest conversations with folk musicians on the Bluegrass Situation Podcast Network. Me, the person who is speaking now? Well, I'm Cindy House, and I'm here with Lizzie No. Hi, Lizzie. Hi, Cindy. How's it going? It's going great. I'm coming at you live from Bentonville, Arkansas, where something miraculous has just happened in my life as a musician. Can I tell you about it? Yes, please. Okay, so I'm like a Lone Star songwriter, not in terms of allegiance to Texas, but in terms of I usually write all my songs by myself. But just today, just this morning, I did my first like true co-write in many years. And it was so fun. Shout out to Billy Keen, great songwriter, cool collaborator. It really made me realize like I've been missing out. Co-writing is super fun. Hmm. So the House of Songs really has changed me. I'm excited to hear this song because what does a Lizzie No song sound like when it's written with not just Lizzie No? We're still figuring it out. I think we're going to maybe play it at Freshgrass this weekend in Bentonville. Shout out to Freshgrass. But stylistically, I mean, I feel like it feels very me. Mm. But I'm sure Billy thinks this feels very, very Billy. And I think that's what co-writing is. No? I will say that I have never seen Lizzie No and Billy Keen in the same place. So who's to say that they're not the same person? <gasps> mm. Mm. We love a conspiracy theory here on Basic Folk. Let me just plant that seed. One thing I love to do on the pod, and I'm actually going to now talk about on a meta level, is like I love to sort of self-mythologize what we do on Basic Folk by s- saying it in the moment, like I just did yes. now. Like We love a conspiracy theory on Basic Folk just to give people the sense that we're like, we're really a phenomenon they should be tracking. Mm-hmm. Historians are like outside our window with their <laughs> notebooks. Like, what are they up to? Oh my God, they're getting into conspiracy theories now. Basic Folk is on the Bluegrass Situation Podcast Network. And before we get into business today, very happy to have Miko Marks and Reese Palmer. I wanted to ask if you would please sign up for our email list. We have a link in the bio. You can go to basicfolk.com. Sign up there. Click on the red sign up button. Uh, You can also follow us on social media at Basic Folk Pod. Or you can make a financial contribution. You can give $5 a month and get a Basic Folk beanie. It's very easy. And it really helps the operation here. Today, uh, we are spotlighting. Celebrating. Celebrating. Miko Marks and Reese Palmer on the podcast today. And we are collaborating with the Bluegrass Situation. They're Artists of the Month. It's kind of interesting. They usually do, you know, like Anit Franco, Rodney Crowell. Right. The Lone Bellow as their Artists of the Month. This month they're doing something different. For the month of June, they're highlighting the Black Opry, which is a collaborative touring collective showcase put together by the fantastic organizer Holly G., who wanted to make a space for black people who are fans of country music and who play country music. And you can find more highlights on the Black Opry at thebluegrasssituation.com. Now, Miko, Marks, and Reese Palmer have been associated in the past with the Black Opry, but honestly, they have been laying the foundation for artists that are in and around the Black Opry for almost 20 years. They have acted as role models and allies for Black country, Black folk, Black Americana artists. I can still remember, like it was yesterday, showing up to Americana Fest in 2021. I had like met this person on Twitter named Holly G. And she said she was putting together a house, like a songwriting house for Black artists that were coming to Americana Fest. I was so hungry for this type of community. Mm -hmm. Um, A couple of years before, I had thrown this party with Sunny War and Trey Burt and Buffalo Nichols, just feeling like there wasn't representation for us in the Americana space in the way that I wanted to see. And then to see Holly step, taking it to the next level, like doing this songwriter house. We didn't know what it was going to become at the time, but I just showed up like, I'm ready to meet anyone else who I like share this life experience in Mm -hmm. common with. Miko Marx and Reese Palmer at that time and still now, they were like 
such important stars in my galaxy. There were so few Black folks and particularly Black women that were getting noticed in country, getting noticed in in Americana. Um, and it wasn't that there was a lack of us. It was that like, you know, the spotlight wasn't getting shown on us as it should be. And and those few that broke through, like Mickey Guyton, Reese, Miko, they were like proof that it was possible to live this life that I'd chosen. And I just look to them as such a great example of how to like keep honing your artistry, mm. keep believing in yourself, keep fostering community, keep sharing with the world and being open, even as prejudice and, you know, lack of opportunity kind of like took a toll on them. You know, they, I feel like they are only getting a portion of the shine that they deserve. And yeah. yet they're so, they're such giants to me. So it was like so meaningful to get to sit down with them and talk with them like two years after we first met at the Black Opry House. Yeah, this is this interview is a blast. Uh, I learned a lot from both of them. Uh, you can just feel the love and admiration that they have for each other and for Lizzie No too. Oh my gosh, so awesome! I'm so bashful. They're such heroes to me. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get to this interview. You're really gonna like this one. And again, you can check out more information about the Black Opry, the Bluegrass Situations Artist of the Month at the BGS website, bluegrasssituation.com. And if I um, remember to, because I'm very irresponsible, I will link it in the show notes. Yeah. Show notes. Show notes. Who's going to write them? No one. Um, okay, <laughs> let's take a listen to a song that Miko and Risi collaborated on. This is I'm Still Here, and then we'll get to our conversation with Miko Marks and Risi Palmer on Basic Folk. Reese Palmer, Miko Marks, welcome to Basic Folk with me, Cindy, and Lizzie Noah is also here. Hi, I'm so excited. Um, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Have, you. have I mentioned I'm excited? I'm excited. I'm excited too. <laughs> this is Reese. No, thank you so much for having us. I'm here, Miko. Hi. Um, I wanted to start off by talking to Reese about Pittsburgh, because I'm in Pittsburgh right now and I've been for like a thousand years. Really? Um, yeah, you grew up or spent the first 12 years of your life in a really beautiful town called Sewickley, which is right outside of Pittsburgh. Um, also not too far away from Wexford, Pennsylvania, which is where Christina Aguilera is from. Yes, she used to be, well, I have the Christina Aguilera story, actually. Well, that's what we want to start with. That's what, that's what we were fishing for. Well, I don't, okay, so let me start, <laughs> let me start by saying I don't know her. So first 12 years, there used to be a show that would come on Saturday morning called Capelli and Kids. And they would, <laughs> this is, I am so dating myself. Um, and they would sing songs and they would make up songs and they would always invite kids to come on and sing. And I remember one Sunday she came on and sang Etta James because this was really <gasps> like, it was like the wheels on the bus go round and round. And then here yeah. comes Christine Aguilera's behind singing Etta James at like five. <laughs> and so it was... <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it blew my mind as a child. I was like, you can do this. 
So, yes, that is my memory of Christina Aguilera very early on. Amazing. I was a Christina stan, like, early, early on. Like, I remember having one of her EPs on CD. Like, remember when they used to make singles as a CD? Like, a bygone era? But I won that. The maxi single? Yeah, I won that. I won her maxi single in a poker game on the fourth grade um, camping trip. I remember that time Amazing. period, and I love, I love the singles, like the CD one song, like it made you want yeah. more after that, you know. Yeah, I still buy forty fives. I think it's such a cute and like fun and compressed way of enjoying music. It's true. I myself am a fan of the ka single. Ka single, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I too love We're a good ka single. Yes. Everyone under the age of 35 just completely tuned out. <laughs> what are these things yeah. you discuss? Yeah, no. <laughs> well, we we have a lot of very serious and deep questions to ask you. So I hope that you're both ready to talk about your feelings and get very emotional. I mean, I'm sitting in my closet. I don't know how much more. Yeah. <laughs> Let's I'm do ready. it. You feel safe? All right. Well, here we go. Miko and Reese. When you first came into each other's onto each other's radars, it was in the mid 2000s and you were both becoming pretty successful in the country music world in Nashville. Although it was put into your minds at the time that there could only be one black woman <laughs> in country and you were made to think that the other was your competition. And you both experienced this surge of jealousy for the other. <laughs> What did you learn from that feeling of jealousy? How did you overcome that feeling? And then what is your relationship to jealousy now? I have to go first because I was probably the most jealous because she was younger, she was taller, and she came out with country girl just looking all beautiful and just like A1 top tier star. Like when I saw Reese, I saw the top of the game. Like I was like, oh my God, who is this black woman? Where did she come from? Like. I was I was nervous. I was scared because I did have that feeling like or it was put into me that it can only be one, you know, and, and she just had so much going for her. I was like, well, it ain't going to be me. You know, I had kind of resolved to that. And I was very, very I was I would see her CDs like in Tower Records and I would just be like, there she is again. There she is again. And this is the honest to God. Would you truth. move them? I would try to just put it to the back. But no, I'm just kidding. I, I wouldn't do that. I just kind of, I had, I was conflicted. Mm -hmm. I was, I was kind of hating, but also am admiring too. If you can have right. those two things exist. I was kind of like, wow. I felt like a kinship too, but I was scared. I ain't gonna lie. I was scared. And that's just Aww. the way the industry kind of pits you against each other in a certain way. But then I started to realize, like, as I watched her grow and as I watched her do the billboard, you know, get on the charts on billboard. I was like, she is going somewhere and ain't nothing you gonna do about it. So you might as well join in on the fun, you know, like support her, love on her, mm -hmm. lift her up because this cookie is gonna get baked. Like the cookie is baking. Can I ask a question before we get Reese's like perspective on that? Mm -hmm. And I wanna say this is a thorny one so you can feel free to pass Miko. Do you ever feel like uh, colorism played a role in seeing one another as a threat uh, initially? I'm not passing. I think that's absolutely true, 110% true. Um, even the layers of colorism, you know, all the things that, you know, fall into that. I would definitely say that played a part. And it still does today to a certain degree. Not in my heart and my soul. Like I'm not I'm not carrying that bag anymore. Um, I've grown and matured as a woman to know that, you know, it's it's enough sunshine for everybody. The sun shines brightly. And so that's my new mindset. I was younger back then and and I do think that colorism played a role. I was like, oh, she's lighter than me. No, just kidding. But, just, but you know, like a real talk, real talk. All mm -hmm. those the things. industry does that to us as black women. Absolutely. Well, no, I was going to say that, um, you know, in looking back on it, the reason I was nodding, I wasn't nodding because like, yes, Lee, Miko didn't like me because I was light skinned. No, I was nodding because I, um, I, I, I recognize now, and I say it very often that a lot of the things that happened to me 
happened because I am light skinned. And like, I completely understand that. And like, um, and, and recognize my privilege in that way. And so, um, yeah, it, 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 it definitely played a role. I think that's a great question because we don't ever talk about that, but that's 100% something that happens. And as far as, um, you know, how it felt in the very beginning, Miko was intimidating for a lot of reasons because Miko was, um, you know, we were both indie in the very beginning when I first learned of her and she happened first. And so while I was still working on my record, Miko was already done and was about to release another record. And Miko's record, if you listen to it, it is one of the most perfect country records I've heard her first album is is it's a perfect country record, like from start to finish, not a perfect country record for a black person, not a perfect country record for a woman, but like a perfect country record for a country artist at that time. And it still stands. It still holds up today. And that was intimidating to me because like I'm not, quote unquote, a traditional country singer. I'm not by any stretch. And Miko really checked that box. Like she's an extremely versatile vocalist. And so, you know, aside from the fact that she's beautiful and 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 charismatic and all of that, like it was that was scary to me because I was just like, you know, she <laughs> she kind of does this better than you. And she happened first. And I would hear of like Miko sightings. Like anytime I would have a meeting, someone would say, oh, we just had a meeting with Miko Marks. Or like I would see in like a lot of the black publications, like they would talk about us in the same thing. And I actually found a magazine. I sent it to her. This is a while ago um, where we were in the I think it was the ACM magazine. We were in an article together, like sat like across in the same article, and it was really kind of trippy. And uh, it's trippy to see it now, like twenty something year old Reese, as opposed to forty something year old Reese, and like seeing that whole contrast and just, just everything. Just it's crazy. So, um, and as far as like today, it's not jealousy; it's more admiration because I just I I love her. And she's my friend. And like, I know that I'm secure in who I am and what I bring to the table. And so I can now appreciate and admire all that she brings to the table Um, because we're very different artists, but, you know, very much, you know, on the same path, but like just different people and different artists. And so like there's no threat because, you know, Miko can only do the Miko thing. And Reese can only do the Reese thing. And so, you know, it's there's comfort in that. And I oh, think that comes with age. when those things come together, when those things come yeah. together, it is truly something special. Because you're right, Reese, we are different. And we, I, all, I thought of this this morning. I was like, you know what? I'm her <laughs> mutt and she's my Jeff. Like, that's what it is to me. Like, that's what it is. And Reese constantly supports me in ways offline that people have no idea. She lifts me up and she knows I'm slow on a lot of things. She's like, I got you. What you need to do is this. And what you need to do is that. Don't use the word slow. Well, I mean that in a like, I'm slow because I choose to be. I I am. I am fading out of the (laughs) uh, out of the realm of keeping up with all this stuff. But yeah, um. We compliment each other in an authentic way, which I really, really love. It's not fake. It's not contrived. It's not something that we're just trying to make happen or capitalize on it. And some, it's just happening and it's beautiful. And I'm glad that we are actually doing these things, doing this tour together. It's so, it's been so refreshing. I've missed this in my life. Two people, two black women joining up together to do music and It's just been powerful for me, personally. Same. I have a question about the flowers. Um, Reese was debuting at the Grand Ole Opry, which is such an important rite of passage for country musicians. And Miko and her husband sent her flowers that night with a note that said, we are proud of you and we see you. Um, We've heard here at Base of Folk that Miko was the only peer to reach out to you on that important night, Reese. And so 
Miko, if you could have delivered those flowers in person, what would your like verbalized note have been? Like, what were you trying to say to her with that, with that, fla- with those flowers and with that note? I was trying to say two things. First, I was saying initially what I wrote in the card, and I had never seen a black woman on on the Grand Old Opry stage in my present day, in my in my lifetime. So I wanted her to really know that. I was proud, you know, like even if it wasn't me, so what? Like this person, this woman, this beautiful person has transcended something that's been, you know, not done in a long time. So I was, that's the first thing I wanted to, I I admired that and I wanted to celebrate her. But then the other side of me wanted to be like, girl, you did the damn thing. Look at yourself and look at you and don't, don't even think that we all don't see you. Like, I see you. I want to acknowledge it. And if I could have taken her those flowers, I would have ran in her dressing room and be like, girl, you done made it now. (laughs) This is the top one, the top, the creme de la creme. I would have just, I just would have been falling all over her. She knows that, though. But I could only put it on a card. And what I could say was that. But yeah, two-sided for sure. Now, I have a question for you, Reese. Um, You've said, I don't get thought of as an artist anymore. Everybody now sees me as a curator or a radio host. Now, here at Basic Folk, we do not agree. We see you as both. Um, But yeah, we do get the sense that you have that feel, that sense of people seeing you more as a host and a curator. How does that perception change the way you show up as an artist and change the stakes for you? Um, That's a great question. God, you're good at this. All right. Um, I learned from the best. No, I well, first of all, I mean, you know, um, I don't I don't want that that statement to sound like I'm cavalier about being a radio host or um, a curator because I take those jobs really seriously and I love those jobs like I, you know, it's something that I wanted to do for a really long time and then finally got the opportunity to do it. Um, I think for me, I I tend to now relish, I appreciate singing so much more than I did before because singing was all I did before. And so, you know, you just, you can't help but sometimes take that talent for granted or whatever. But then when you're like, no one calls me to sing anymore. And so <laughs> you're like, you're trying to, you're like, hey, but, but I want to sing. And so now when I get an opportunity to do it, like, I'm just like, yes, this is, I am in purpose. And so um, I, I just, I respect it and appreciate it more. And I take my voice. It is this whole thing, like this whole shift in my career has made me take my voice more seriously as well. Um, Literally and figuratively. Like I try to take care of myself. I try to have quiet days and like really respect the instrument that I have because, you know, I'm very fortunate that I haven't had to have surgeries or any of that kind of stuff. But like we've had some very close calls. And so like I use my voice probably the most that I have ever in my life between my children and just like everyday life and my job, jobs and, you know, singing. So it's um, I I definitely appreciate the gift a lot more. And I, I try to be respectful of it. This question is for Miko. Um, you said, I was trying to come back into music and then Reese started her radio show, Color Me Country. And she was like, I want you to be my first guest. That made me cry. So Miko, in terms of your experiences with the press up to that point, it seems like your interview on Color Me Country was a reset. Why was it important that Reese be the first person you'd talk to as far as your return to country music? And were there ways of talking about your music that you wanted to leave behind? First, it was really like a gift when Reese asked me to be on that, be her first guest. And she threw this podcast on me. I had no idea because I had taken myself kind of out of the, the music making world for a while. And so it was like a gift from, I say, my little higher power that said, hey, I want you to do this. So her being the first person to really reach out and say, let's do this together. It was just organic and natural and and just easy. 
and you fast forward all those years that I hadn't done any interviews, I was able to talk to her freely in a way that maybe years ago I wouldn't have been. I had all these these blocks and barriers. When I talk to Reese, it's like talking to Oprah. She's going to get something out of me easily because it's like I'm chatting with a girlfriend. You know, I'm chatting. And so that was probably the marker for me coming back the way I came back. Now I do all the interviews kind of like that for the most part, you know, but it was really special that I could be authentically me and myself and not not have any expectations or any rigidness about what I wanted to talk about. It was easy to talk to her and it was not lost on me. That was my first real, like, real interview back to, so to speak. That's powerful. I have a question for you, Miko. Um, in a 2021 interview with Marcus Dowling, hi, Marcus, if you're listening, um, with Holler Country, you said that before you released Our Country, you felt like I'm an OG in the game, but I still hadn't left a legacy of music of which I could be proud. So now you're two albums later. How are you thinking about your legacy now? Um, do you still feel the same way? When I said that I was really thinking about more so the issues I was talking about in my music, I was proud of my other albums. Like I was proud of those too, but I was in a different space to where maybe I wouldn't talk about that. I feel like now the music that I'm making is really important to me spiritually not just a regular sing song or yeah, it's something somebody wrote for me and I just sing the song. No, these are subjects that are just really important to me and the legacy I feel like I'm leaving now is something I can, you know, lay my head down and say, I did it. I did what I was meant to do and I, I did what I was supposed to do. No matter how it is accepted, it feels really good to be talking about things that are important to me in this stage. Whereas before I recorded, and people were writing songs and I wrote some, but they were all singy, songy, kind of immature songs for me. And now looking back on what I was doing. And now I just feel like it's so much to be said and so much to be taken seriously when doing a song. Like, why not say it? Why not do it mm-hmm. in, on my own terms? Can you give an example of a song you've released that like 20 something Miko, like, might not have been brave enough to share girl or something that's like really representative of like where you're at now yes i would not have been able to share good night america mm. i would not have been able to share that I would have been like i'm not singing that people are gonna hate me they're <laughs> gonna say i'm i'm down in america but really what the song is about is just america writing its wrongs and really seeing what those wrongs were acknowledging them and it's kind of like to put the the lullaby is to put all the things that America has has been built upon to, to rest, put that to sleep and let's just recreate anew. So I would have been really apprehensive about good night, America. <laughs> I just would have been. But today I feel like it's very um, it's very important. That's the song that really brought me back to recording. And um, it was written by Justin Phipps. And I had a band with him like 15 years ago. And then fast forward, I called him saying, hey, we need to make some music. I didn't know he started a label and had this song. And when I heard it, I was like, this is me now. This is who I am. I want to say this. And I want my voice to say it. It's interesting because like, it's 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 easy to see like, as we as we have albums of yours from different periods of your life, like we can see how you've changed, but I also feel like the world has changed and it and it's possible that there are different like there, it might have not been listened to the way that it's received now. Does that feel mm. fair? Like the the environment for creating honest and political and spiritual music is different than it was when you first got started. Like, can you talk about how your son is working in the music industry now? Like, do you see him working in a different Nashville than than you had? Oh, absolutely. Um, I can see my son. Um, he just has a different space, like the whole social media aspect of everything and not having as many gatekeepers, still having some, but but not having, uh, you know, there's more connection between artists now. It's just a bigger, it's a bigger world than when I first started coming out. And I, I definitely can see him moving and shaking in the industry in a way that I was not able to. And he's doing that. I'm really proud of him. He's making the music he wants. He's crossing genres. He's just 
doing music and that and that in and of itself is something that um I wasn't really able to do back in the day because there were all these boxes I had to check. Well, now there are no boxes. We're not checking anything. We're just checking for good music, and that's it. I have a question for Reese. What to you makes for great children's music? Um, and what has writing for children taught you about yourself as a musician? And will there ever be a follow-up to Best Day Ever? Okay. So what what makes good children's music? I think music that, for me, music that doesn't talk down to them. Kids are really smart. Um, <laughs> my kids are very smart. And um, you can't put anything past them. And so rather than... One of the biggest compliments that I've ever received as a parent is a teacher telling me that my kid understands sarcasm better than the other children and <laughs> is constantly confusing and, and confusing the other kids. I thought that was like the coolest thing because that like you have to be you have to kind of be very intelligent and a little sophisticated in order to kind of get the nuance. And so I never have talked down to my children. I talk to them like they're they're little people. And that's how we talk to each other. And so that's how I do my music. And I also really believe in empowering children. Like they don't need to just hear wah, 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 wah. Like tell them something, plant something in them. Um, And so I tend to make, I try to make empowering music for children. And, And that's the kind of stuff that I gravitate towards um, you know, for my own little ones to listen to. Um, I was really fortunate. I got to do a song about body autonomy and consent, um, during the pandemic, which was like, I, I wrote this, I wrote the verses to that song thinking that someone else was going to rap it. And I ended up being the one that rapped it, but, um, I'm a terrible rapper, but, um, it was, um, I love making that song so much. Because like no one told me that kind of stuff when I was a kid. So like it's nice to be able to impart that kind of information to little minds. And and hopefully that has an effect on them, you know, 10, 15 years down the road. You remember that when you're in the car with the guy that's not keeping his hands to himself and like that kind of thing. And you know that you can say no and you can leave and it's okay. Mm. Um, I am working on the follow up. I've actually already written it. Um, yeah, it's called, it's called Seeds. I need it. And, um, that, as soon as I finish. Oh, Reese, do you seeds. need any special <laughs> guests on your children's album? Because I think Lizzie No would love to participate. Yes. No, real talk. We should talk afterwards because I would actually love that. So, the, this project I'm, is. I just played my first children's show and it like lit this fire in me. Yes. Because now I'm a stepmom and it's so important to me to like not let my kids listen to crappy music yes. and actually listen to things that are like good music and like worth listening to, you know? Oh my God. Okay. So really like seriously offline, we're going to talk about this because okay, let's talk. <laughs> it's so it's a combination of, um, it's a, I want to talk about real stuff on this record. And so like, we're talking about welcoming a new baby to the family. We're talking, mm-hmm. I have a song called welcome to the family. And like, it's talking about all the crazy people in your family. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, kid, you're in it now. Um, and then we have a song, there's a song called superpower because my little one was just, um, diagnosed, not diagnosed, but she was just, um, analyzed and she's on the spectrum. And so I want to, I wanted to empower her. So we wrote a song called Superpower about her, you know, about her, the way she sees the world and that it's, it's awesome, actually, the way you see the world. And there's some lullabies and some stuff like that. But I just, this one is, is um, a little bit more focused because this is Nova's album. The first album was Grace's album. This is Nova's album. So... Um, we, even though we tell her that the little girl on the cover of best day ever is her, so she won't be mad. Um, she's going to get her (laughs) own album this time. And, uh, yeah, so I, there is a follow up, and 
Lizzie, I I think you may be on it. So <laughs> we'll we'll go from there. I, I think volunteer. that's so dope. I volunteer as tribute. I love that. That's <laughs> exciting. Okay, I have another question, and it's actually for both of you about how the environment for um, making music, particularly as Black women, has changed. Um, so we all know in 2020, the great Holly G had an idea for a blog where she would write about country artists that she loved and write about her experiences being um, a country music fan who is black. Three years later, we are very much living in that reality of like the Black Opry is on the scene. Not only is it a blog, it's a touring group. Um, It's sort of an advocacy organization. It's a a lot of different things. Yeah, it's a movement. And so now that it's like real and concrete in the world, what are your hopes for Black Opry Um, and organizations like it that are trying to advocate for black artists in the country music space. Like, what do you think that artists need from our organizations like Black Opry? Um, well, I talk about this a lot and, um, and you know, I'm trying to, I just got nonprofit status myself, so I'm about to start doing some things. Um, we need a focus on artistry because, um, in a lot of ways, Black artists have been shut out of some of shut out of or just are unaware because there aren't people at the top telling them about the artist development that takes place every day in Nashville. And a lot of them are missing it. And so I want to make sure that from top to bottom, um, people that are coming are. You know, we we say the thing about the cake, like she said, th- this cookie is going to get baked. Well, like I want to make sure that everybody's fully baked before they get their moment, mm-hmm. because one of the things that I notice about gatekeepers in Nashville is if it's hot right now, then it's hot to me. And so I'm going to put it out and it might not be ready to be put out. It may not be ready for you to see it. It may not be ready for you to enjoy it, but I'm doing it because I, I, I need your reaction. I need to do it. And so I hate to see people squander opportunities before they're ready for them. And so my biggest thing is for artists of color first and then artists, everybody is artist development. It's a lost art and it's a thing that needs to happen. And I that's one of the things that I advocate for really big. I just want you to be ready for your moment. What does artist development look like for people that might be listening who aren't musicians, yeah. aren't in the industry? What does it look like for an artist who has really had that investment put into them? Well, I think like, for example, I can use Miko and I, um, you know, I've been playing in bands since I was 16 years old and playing in bars and singing to people that don't give a damn about anything that I'm saying or anything like that. And so from those experiences, from busking in little five points in Atlanta and in Soho and all that kind of stuff, I learned presence. I learned what Reese Palmer does on stage whenever she's on stage, how she takes up space, how she projects a song and all that stuff. And that comes from experience. And you can't just get that just going like and being, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can't just get that. That doesn't just happen to you. Miko, same thing. There's a way that she takes up space on stage that you can tell that this isn't her first time. This isn't her hundredth time. This isn't her thousandth time. Like, this is, she she been at this. And so there's also a confidence that you take into the writer's room when you sit down and write a song that you don't have the first time you write a song. You don't have it the hundredth time you write a song. It's from writing so many terrible songs that no one will ever hear. And so you get that thing where you can just sit down and you're like, I know what comes next. And that comes from working at it and from being developed and having mentors and having examples and study And that sort of thing. So like that's that's the process that I want to make sure that people have before they move on to all these amazing opportunities and moments. Um, I 100 percent agree with Reese. I feel like the Black Opry, first of all, when they first came out, I was the little moniker. One of my album covers with the little moniker. And when Holly changed it, I was like, oh, I'm (laughs) gone. They done leveled up, which is awesome in the space that she has created for artists to feel seen, to feel safe, 
to um, be given light to, um, I think is it's just it's just beautiful. I'm loving to see all the things, but 110 percent, it does us no good if we get out there and we're not ready for that moment to be seen in the way that we've been really working hard to do. And um, I have to say, I did have artist development when I was coming out, but I had too much. They were trying to tell me what to do, tell me how to be, wear this weave, put this hat, mm-hmm. cowgirl hat on, say <laughs> these things, you know, all all of that. And But it does take, like Reese said, years of experience, getting getting told no, you know, getting all the things, you know, getting sitting down with writers and throwing away the bad songs. Just don't put it out there because you wrote it. And that's probably the foundation of what I would like to see for the most part is artist development. Because once you get developed, ain't no telling where you can go. You like, can't stop. Yeah. Hmm. You can't be stopped. It sounds like it's important who is actually doing the development. Absolutely. That part. I just got pointed at by both Lucy Palmer and Nico Marx. They both pointed at me. Well, you know, I'm going to no, say... it's so true because so, people sometimes think they're developing an artist, but they're actually limiting Hindering, the yes. Yeah. I'm gonna, I want to throw two things in and then I'm done talking. I want to say this. I think that sometimes gatekeepers and I've, I've been I'm, I'm aware of this whether people know that I, I but I see you sometimes people will purposely put someone in a position before they're ready because they would like to discredit you and so mm. I don't want to see that for these artists and for these people because then the next thing you know is well such and such I, I went to that show and it was terrible so you, you we don't have to consider them for anything and so that's one thing I want to avoid and then the second thing is oh my god you can be developed in the wrong way I can't tell you how many meetings were had about whether Reese's hair should be straight or not whether I should have a white man or a black man be my love interest in a video. Um, whether, you know, if how much weight I needed to lose or, you know, did I, there was a talk one time about it, whether I was believable looking enough as a black woman. Like, do, will people really think she's, <laughs> will people think she's just biracial or will people think that she's like a real black woman? This is a real conversation that happened. And so, like, artist development can go horribly wrong in the wrong hands. So, yeah. Wow. The look of murderous rage (laughs) that crossed my eyes is not going to be audible in the final podcast, but I do want our listeners to know (laughs) that it was real. Um, And I am holding a knife. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about the Black Opry show that Reese and Miko played together. It was in June of 2020 in Berkeley, California. It was a Thursday. It was a Thursday. Um, Reese said that show we played together kind of cemented to me what this could be if the two of us went out on the road together. So what was it about that show that let (laughs) you know it was something you needed to create a tour out of? And actually, to Lizzie and I, it actually feels like more than being more is being created than than just a tour. Um, it felt like the two kids that get in trouble in the back of church <laughs> for being too loud. That's what, it, that's what it felt like. I felt so bad for Leon Timbo. Shout out to Leon and to Stephanie. John. You know, Leon Timbo was on the worship team in church. He yes. was not passing notes. He was not chatting. He was paying attention. <laughs> I was, was not, however. Leon Timbo is our hottest dad. <laughs> hottest dad. Ah, look at that. I love We love that. you, Leon Timbo. We love you, Leon Timbo. I just pulled out the basic folk calendar, and Leon Timbo is <laughs> the June artist of the month, actually. And he is our hottest dad. I love that for him and for y'all yes. and for everyone yes. that has that calendar. Um, I like that calendar. <laughs> all 20 of you. <laughs> I love that. No, I... Um, I <laughs> 
I, it was just, it felt like, like Miko and I were like talking back and forth when we weren't supposed to be talking. And like <laughs> people were having like serious moments. We were not. And um, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was, it was pandemonium and chaos in the best possible way. And I was just like, this could be so much fun. And people were noticing that there was another show happening during the full show. And so, yes. like, someone came up to Miko. I'll let Miko tell that part. Oh, yes. Um, somebody came up to me and said, I would watch the Miko and Rishi show anytime. And that happened at that, at this, at, at Frayden Salvage. And we just had so much genuine good fun up there. Like, a lot of shows, you know, you do the show, you do it with all these people, and there's no connection. Well, we have a connection that could not be avoided. And, and somebody was like, I will watch the Miko and Reese show. Well, I say Reese and Miko show. But, the, and then I, kept, I got that a few more times and I told her, and I think this is, I was already, you already asked me to go to the Long Road Festival with you when you took a bunch of Color Me Country artists out there. So that was just a taste of what it was going to be in London. I got to tell y'all this story. So Reese and I are in London. We're doing the we're doing the stage, and we go over to where they sell merch. And Reese has a poster with her name on it and Color Me Country and everything. And so she goes up there with her money, and she goes to buy this poster. I said, "Why are you buying this poster? You <laughs> own this bad. poster. They need to give you this poster. You put your money back." So she bought it because she wants to support, and I get that too. So I'm complaining about her buying this poster. We get food and she has the posters rolled up. And I was like, I can't believe you bought that poster. She took the poster, hit me on the head and was like, shut up. And then I was like, I felt so <laughs> silly afterwards because I knew her whole thing was two steps ahead of I shouldn't buy this poster. It was like, I support this festival. And that's kind of like how our relationship is. Like she's younger than me, but I learned so much from her just in like, little dealings of how we operate. Reese is the leader of this crew, of this wrecking crew. Aww. She 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 shows me things and my vision has gotten even bigger than what I thought I was doing. I thought I was growing as this person, but being connected to her and doing the stuff that we're doing, I've gotten a larger bit and we have had so much fun out here. I'm telling you, it's been great. It has been great. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. I, yeah, it's the, it's the I mean, truth. I look. I appreciate you, girl. Like that's um, that means a lot. Thank you. It's, it's I'm not the gonna truth. cry. <laughs> it <laughs> is the true thing. <laughs> this is like I'm living one of my wildest dreams. Oh, it's sweet. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you, Reese. Um, can you talk about the writing process for the song "Still Here"? Um, and why it was important to you to collaborate with Miko on this song and what it felt like to perform it on your co-headlining tour or what it feels um, like as you sure, tour sure. So still here, started, I still have the, um, the audio memo I sent you. So this was a while ago. I was standing at my kitchen sink and I was like just humming this thing and I was like, like a hurricane, like a tree standing in a hurricane. That was the first line. And I didn't know what the rest of it was, but I was just like, this would be cool to write with Miko. And so I hit her, I sent her a vocal memo and it was just me <laughs> just hitting a G chord over and over again. Cause I had no idea what it was going to be. And I was just like, what do you think about this? It's like a vibe. And she was like, Oh girl, yeah, let's write it. So we, in, we all ended up being in, um, in Nashville for Americana Fest in 2022 no 2021 2021, 2021. and that was that was the first um americana fest i've ever been to and um that's when i met you both yes for the first yes. time that's right outside of the box and so it I was call, pivotal i call this the box <laughs> um so yeah we 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 wrote we sat down in um our co-writer deanna walker's uh, the Yellow Room, where I have written and cried about many songs over the years. Deanna and I have written together since I was literally 25 years old. We have written forever together. And um, and Justin was there. And uh, Justin Phipps, who is who works, who is a collaborator of Miko's and runs her record label, all of that. Um, 
And we just sat there and we wrote this song. And then I remember, I remember thinking like, it's not quite finished yet. And so I bugged them for like months because I was like, okay, we need to fix this. We need to fix this. We need to fix, because I just wanted this to be perfect. I wanted this to be more perfect than anything else I'd ever written before because I knew how big of a moment it could be if it was written well and it was written right. So I remember driving to Tampa for spring break and (laughs) in my car, texting them lyrics. What do you guys think about this? And them writing me back. And they're in California. So this was like 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning that we're driving and I'm texting her. And I know they were like, please get off the phone crazy girl but I did and and we did and we wrote this song and I think that it's um you know it's autobiographical a little bit like it's both of us and there's lines in there (laughs) uh Michael Trotter from the Warren Treaty texted me he was listening to the song and he said I feel like (laughs) I feel like there's a line that's like MFers I told y'all and I was like it's implied (laughs) it's It's subtext it's subtext so yeah, it's uh, it, it 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 if it if it if it touches anybody's sore spot, it's supposed to. Yeah, still here. Mm-hmm. Also, I love Michael Trotter so much. Yes, Michael oh. is. I love. Okay, I'm gonna have a, a very quick Warren Treaty love moment. I've known Warren Treaty. Do it. Since they were playing for ten people at coffee houses around the the East Coast. And I remember sitting at one of those coffee houses and being like, why the hell are they here? Because why aren't you like at Aretha Franklin's house or something like where yeah. you should be? I just feel like that's where you should be. And um, to see them <laughs> achieving everything that they are achieving is exactly what they deserve and what they work for. Yeah. So like this is all like. I just like them, like Miko, whenever I see y'all doing stuff, like when I saw you get next woman of country and all that, like, yes, where's the rest of it? Cause there's yeah. more, where's the rest of her stuff? Get the rest of her stuff out of layaway. Like it, she needs it now. <laughs> give her, give her her stuff. Well, I feel like those moments are like, you got to see that artist development that you were talking about. I always feel like so privileged mm-hmm. when I see when I feel sure that an artist is going to be huge, whether it's selling a ton of records or just like having a huge impact artistically, like when I get to see somebody early on, I feel like so blessed to see that those early stages of their development, because they're learning who they are in front of you. It's, it's Mm. such a privilege to see. So Reese, you were talking about when you first played that black Opry show with Miko that you felt like, the kids in the back of the church getting in trouble. (laughs) And Miko, when you were talking about how you perform without abandon, you say you just go to when you were a little girl in church. So more on that, please. What were you each like as little girls in church? (laughs) And then how do you recognize that girl in you now? My, My girl is still here. She is living largely inside my body. That little girl is cutting up sideways not taking life too seriously, kind of still, I don't take my my voice too seriously or my vocals or I'm kind of like walking through life like (laughs) doing my singing. People like, no, no, this is this is really something special. But I'm still cackling. Reese has to keep me focused on this tour. She is really keeping me focused, like keeping me laughing. If I could show you this video, I won't show anyone, but (laughs) she had me dying. She does such good impersonations. Like we can get off a field and she'll do you. She'll do both of you, your impersonations and hit you dead on. Like she's just Ah. good at it. And I'm videotaped her and I woke up to it this morning and I just laughed for a good solid 10, 15 minutes just watching you do that impression. (laughs) I'm still thinking about it. So I'm having, I'm I'm still a kid right now. I might be 50 years old, but I am a childlike character and I will be probably till I'm 80, 90 years old. I'm going to be like still, still like a kid. It's just in me. And so um, that little girl who sang in church, I just get up on stage and do the same thing. I've just gotten to where I know how to do it a little bit better than I used to. Yeah, no, little Reese is still there. Um the kid that got in trouble for talking now talks for a living. So, 
No, um, but <laughs> uh, I am um, so little Reese in church. That's where I started singing. And um, I was so small that I couldn't reach the microphone. So I had to stand on a milk crate. And um, I found a video when we were getting ready for the documentary. I had to compile a bunch of footage and stuff. And so I found my first solo. I'm four. And Oof. I'm standing and I'm singing Jesus Loves Me. No, I'm singing He Lives. That's what it is. It was Easter Sunday. I and so tomorrow. my mother, girl, my mama was like quintessential Southern. And so like the socks were the frilliest. The bows were the largest. And like the dress was the poofiest. I look like cake. And um, I w and she taught me a thing. My mom was a ham. Like my mom, my mom is the real star. My mother was the real star. And, you know, I, anything cool that I do is just because I'm her daughter. Um, she uh, mm. she told me, she said, at the end, Reese, put your hand over your heart when you go, he lives within my heart. And I had like a little accent because both my parents are from the South, even though I was in Swickley. So that's how I said it. The video is hilarious. He lives. And then, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm still her. <laughs> I love it. Um. Miko, you touched on this a little bit earlier when you were talking about how your son is experiencing this freedom to move between genres um, that you didn't really feel that you had or like it's a greater freedom now. Um, I'd like to hear from you both about how, like, I think you get a lot of questions like, what's it like to be a black woman in country music, blah, blah, blah. How has that experience actually affected you aesthetically? Like, are there creative liberties that like, in a perfect world you wish you could take? Are there genres you wish you could explore? Like, given carte blanche, what are some experiments you would do with your art? I, I feel like I'm taking liberties now, even though people kind of put me in the country box. I'm taking liberties already. I'm, I'm gospeling it up. I'm jazzing it up. I'm bluesing stuff up. I mean, I'm, I'm really not a country artist. You know, I would say my earlier work, work fell way into that category more than my new. I think it's more Americana music. You know, it's just roots music. And um, I remember when my son was 10, we sang at the Country Music Hall of Fame. Um, no, Country CMA Fest. And I made him play for me. And girl, I had to twist his hand. I was like, Justin, please play this song with me. And, you know, he was like, I don't want to, you know, doing the whole kid thing. I was like, if you play, I'll give you this money. And so, so I think I taught him at an early age that you could, you could get some coins if you do, if you play the music. So fast forward, he never wants to play with me, never wants to play with me. Do you know, he said to me the other little while ago, he was like, mama, when are we going on tour? I was like, who is this person who never wanted to play? Now the music is cool enough for him. And so he's, I told him he got to work up to this level. You got to work up to getting on tour with me. Forget Blast and forget Billy. What's, what's the Billy? Billy. See, I don't know these people. Eilish. Billy Eilish, yeah. Her and forget um, he's going out with Ed Sheeran. I'm like, yeah, yeah, but you can't play on my tour yet. You got to have some soul. I'm no, just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I think, um, I think I'm just taking liberties and just doing music. I don't really necessarily care where it falls. Because I just really want to touch people all across genres. So if I could do that by making the music that I want and they put it in the category that they want, that's fine, too. It really I, I could care less about a category, to be honest. I have one final question, and I think Cindy's going to wrap up. I have a question for both of you. What advice would you give to up and coming black femme artists who are hoping for not only success, but for longevity and happiness in their creative careers. I am asking for a friend. The friend is me. <laughs> um, I mean, Lizzie, first of all, you are already quite legendary. So um, I stand. Uh, <laughs> I stand no, you. I stand. Standing all um, day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I yeah. Yeah, you're already well on your way. But I think the best thing and OK, well, I can frame it like this. 
one of the things I really love about you and I, I loved about you so much that I wanted to have you on my show was you're very distinct in who you are. There's nobody else that does Lizzie know. There is nobody else that um, <laughs> that makes the music that you make, uh, writes the songs that you write and expresses it the way that you do. And I think that's longevity. I think that's how you come to become regarded as iconic, because think about all the people that we all love and that we all hold up and hold dear. Nobody sings like Aretha Franklin. There's a lot of people that can do impersonations, but nobody did it before her like her. Um, Ella Fitzgerald. There is nobody that sings like Ella Fitzgerald. There are people that are in the style of Ella Fitzgerald, but there is nobody that is Ella Fitzgerald. Whitney Houston. Same thing. We all grew up on Whitney. Whitney is in is in our music, but Whitney was singularly her own thing. And so I think when you take the time to get to know yourself and take the time to get to understand your why for doing this, that's when you discover your purpose and you discover your sound and you discover the thing that is, that's yours that no one else can do. And so I encourage every young artist that I encounter, um, to instead of worrying about, you know, your aesthetic and all this kind of stuff, worry about getting to know yourself and how this all works, because that'll change the way you write. It'll change the way you approach singing. It'll change the way you approach playing your stage presence, all of that. I mean, I know they did it for me. Had I not gotten married and had babies and moved to North Carolina and had that incubation period, um, my music would be very different. I love my first album. I feel like Miko. I love my first album. I I am all in through that. But 41-year-old Reese, I think, has more important things to say than 19-year-old Reese did and 25-year-old Reese did. And that's because I took the time away from the business to get to know myself. So that's my that's my spiel. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> oh, thanks for giving it. Miko, <laughs> advice? Um... When I saw you with the harp, I was just done. When I saw you with the, I was done. I was like, so she's leveled up. She's leveled up beyond what, what the, what's the base where everybody is. You're, you're just multifaceted on so many levels, highly intelligent and highly talented, you know? So like, I feel like you know yourself and at the point you are now, you can know, you don't, you know yourself more than anybody. Like I knew myself at that, at, at your age. And so that, I just what I know that I'm doing differently now is I'm tapping into my authentic spirit when I sing on stage. It's not going through the motions. I used to go through the motions. Oh, you got a pretty voice. People like to hear a pretty voice. So I just say these words. No, if I say one word and I'm like and I'm telling you, I'm going to say it with a fervor of something. Just this building just cracked the wide open because that's what I want. Every time I get on a stage, I want to just leave my whole heart. Now, you can step on it. You can you can drag it. You can love it. But if I just let it out, that's my healing. That's my process. I make sure that I am in tune with me spiritually every time I sing. And then I think that as a young artist, if you get to, get to really tap into yourself, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because it ain't all cute. Get into that mm -hmm. ugliness, get into that mm -hmm. sorrow, get into the happy place too, but get into all those spaces and something beautiful can't help but come from that. That's my spiel. Mm. Whew. I Amazing. just have some allergies and um, yeah. also my neighbor's cutting onions in their kitchen. So <laughs> that's what's going on here. Thank you both. <laughs> Thank you guys. <laughs> okay, ladies, let's do a quick lightning round. Oh, wait, no, we're not done. <laughs> we just... I was about to be the, uh. <laughs> Listen, we've had a lot of heavy times and a lot of feelings expressed, so let's have some fun and do the lightning round. You ready? Yes. yes. Okay, Lizzie, you start. Okay, this you both have to answer each question for yourself. Just think fast. Bam, first instinct. So, of each other, Reese, what's your favorite Miko Mark song? And Miko, what's your favorite Reese Palmer song? 
Good night, I America. Know, I'm, going, I'm going first. I got a new song that I've heard on tour. Good night. The lullaby. Oh, from the baby. Yeah, from the baby mm-hmm. album. I'm not going to lie. So That's dope. my favorite it's song. It's so dope Mine live. It, it's so dope live. I saw it performed and I was just like, I watched this grown audience fall in love with Reese in that song in a way that's not mm-hmm. for children. So, good night. <laughs> no, it's not. Good night. <laughs> this is a very important question. When did you get your first boho hippie dress? <gasps> 14. I wanted to be Lisa Bonet so bad. Oh, man. I, I, yeah, I, I was going to say kind of, yeah. I mean, <laughs> look at her roster, for God's sake. <laughs> like, girl. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, I've been wearing Moomoo since I was eight because I missed all the little girl sizes. So I just, I call everything a Moomoo. You're stupid. You are so silly. (laughs) What? (laughs) It's real. (laughs) Who was your first celebrity crush? Lenny Kravitz. Still is. (sighs) Well, I got to say this, man, but Matthew McConaughey. Girl, Why? Don't tell nobody. Don't tell (laughs) nobody. Listen. McConaughey who? Don't tell okay. nobody. So Miko, Miko, that ex- <laughs> that explains. I know. Wow. I know. I know. Okay, I'm girl. sorry. Go it's ahead. bad. <sighs> What's one song you wish you had written? Nick of Time by Bonnie Ray. I wish Ooh. I wrote that song. Yes. Chain Gone Come. Oh, also good. Okay, what are you doing five minutes before you go on stage? <laughs> Drinking wine. <laughs> This is not, this is off the rails. Drinking wine. You know what I'm just kidding? Mm-hmm. It's great. Waiting for Miko to give the cue. <laughs> and then I come out. <laughs> no, because we go out together. Try to remember. What's your favorite comfort food? Oh. Macaroni and cheese. Burgers. How many burgers, how many burgers do you have in a month? I have one. One. But probably two or three. One. Probably one. One a month. Four. I try not to do four. All right, great. I try not to do red meat, so I only do it like it's only break glass in case of emergency. If you see a service animal in public, what's the first thought that goes through your mind? Are you a real one? <laughs> <laughs> your daddy's lying. Right. You ain't no service yeah. animal. You just got right. that clothes on with you, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh my god. <laughs> this is the best one. Okay, this is the last question. In your lifetime, what has been your most embarrassing fashion moment? Wearing that weave, that wig I used to have. Embarrassing. This is a safe space, Miko. Thank you. Wig amnesty. Listen. Uh, yeah. You know what? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with Miko. The very first photo shoot that I ever did when I signed my record cut my record deal, <laughs> they braided up my hair and put uh Malaysian silky on and I did a photo shoot and I swear to God the pictures look like I'm a feature dancer at a strip club. Like could be worse. I maybe? have on like this. At really, least you were featured. I mean, but it looks it really, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. It's like ladies and gentlemen, Friday and Saturday night, satin lace will be here. Like if they're like <laughs> the <headliner>. hair, <laughs> satin the hair lace. comes. <laughs> the hair comes like all the way down to here and it's blowing and I'm wearing this chiffon see through. I don't know what they were trying Girl. to make me look like, but like the see-through V-neck, boobies up, like, you know, almost showing what what the Lord gave me and all that. And like wind, lots of wind. So yeah, it totally did look like that. Featured though. Featured. <laughs> Featured. I might bring the pictures Featured. to Philly actually so you can see them because they're amazing. So I can be dying. <laughs> Thank you. I will be dying. Girl. <laughs> Listen, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for both joining us, Reese Palmer and Miko Marks on Basic Folk. Um, we are such fans, and it was a real honor to be able to get to talk to you in this capacity. Love we love y'all. y'all. Thank you so much for coming on Basic Folk. We love you. Thank you for asking us. Yes. This episode of Basic Folk was produced by John Nungester. Alex Stanton composes our music. Basic Folk is on the Bluegrass Situation Podcast Network. You can find all of our episodes there. Wherever you get podcasts, search for us on the SiriusXM app under Basic Folk, or you can check out our website. 
basicfolk.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye. Bye.